Hi everyone, I'm going to do something a bit different for this episode. On March 1st, 2019, I was asked to do an AMA in the Yang for President HQ subreddit. So I thought that for this episode, I would go through the AMA, read the questions I was asked, and then read the answers that I gave. So effectively, this episode will be a big Q&A based off of questions that I was asked by Andrew Yang supporters. So without further ado, here are the questions. And I'll just go down in order, reading, essentially these are sorted by best. So the order will be the most popular questions that were voted up the highest down to the last of the questions that I answered. J. Brown SC asked, do you feel that UBI experiments have had enough success on the whole over the last 40 plus years that it's time for us to stop thinking about them as experiments and more like proven systems for helping solve societal and economic problems? I said yes. Experiments have their place as a tool of awareness building and influencing people who care about evidence, but really most people don't care about evidence. There's piles and piles of evidence out there about how efficient and effective cash transfers are, and yet here we are, in a world where it's the very last thing anyone wants to try. Give Directly, for example, was a pioneer in the field of philanthropy with the idea of just giving people cash. The results are absolutely clear that what they do is hugely efficient and hugely effective, and some orgs out there are seeing it and following suit, but still, You've got the Bill Gates out there who believe strongly that despite all the evidence in favor of cash, whatever they want to do is more effective. Give everyone a chicken? Sure, why not? To hell with the reality that people could use their money to buy chickens if they wanted chickens. Instead, we can't trust people, and it's up to us to make their decisions for them. Cash without conditions works. It just does. We know that. We also know that pilots can be ended prematurely and that every pilot ends anyways, leaving people in the position of having more freedom, dignity, and security, and then having it taken away. I'd much prefer we just make immediate policy steps. Carbon dividends are my favorite. Let's do that immediately. Get everyone used to receiving $100 per month as a dividend. Watch what it does to the economy and to poverty. The proof in the pudding is always in the eating, right? So let's do that. Child allowances? Yes. Fully refundable tax credits? Yes. A national sovereign wealth fund? Yes. Data dividends? Yes. States introducing small UBI like Alaska's? Yes. Every way we can figure out to get cash to people unconditionally, let's do that. Next question is by T.S. Bandit, and he asked, Hi Scott, I'm about to start looking for jobs after getting my PhD in computer science, but I'm apprehensive about getting a job at a typical company whose mission isn't making society better for everyone. Is it possible for me to get involved with contributing to the UBI movement? Are there companies or nonprofits that are working on making UBI a reality and who need me as an employee? Here's my response. I remember seeing this question before and adding it to my Q&A queue. Thanks for asking it again. Interesting too, your question about seeking to make a difference in the world instead of just earning a paycheck. I think that's something more people are looking for, and it actually means a willingness to earn less to make a difference, which is something UBI can support through lifting the income floor. There are many ways to get involved with the UBI movement. Being here means you're already aware of one of the best of them, which is to volunteer your time and abilities to furthering Yang's campaign. But there's certainly more you can do, just in general, by doing what you can to spread awareness of the idea and getting creative in doing so. I don't know how much of a programmer you are, but as one example, there's certainly an opportunity to make indie games built around furthering the idea. Being an employee is of course much more challenging than a volunteer, I try to make a point of posting any job posting I see to r slash basic income. Type flare colon job in the search box there. There's not a lot, but it happens. And more opportunities are beginning to open up as more places begin to get more serious about UBI. 
One example is Stanford's Basic Income Lab, but there are others popping up. It's a real challenge to get paid to be part of a movement. I used Patreon, and that's what enables me, so that's always a possibility. Part of my Patreon is what I call the Big Patreon Creator Pledge, which is that I pledge what I earn over $1,000 per month to others pledging to do the same. So you could potentially start up your own Patreon page and start creating stuff to build up your patron following with me being one of your patrons. Whatever you do, thank you, and good luck. The next question was from Brush Mechanic, who asked, My husband works at an Amazon fulfillment center. Recently, he implemented an, an idea that would conserve 40 hours of labor costs and added a 10-point bump in productivity. That's insane. Their response? How well would this work with the robotic arm? Then he was sent home early because there will be absolutely no overtime approved. Another thing that's happened recently is the minimum wage hike at $15 per hour for new hires. He is at that pay scale as a supervisor. It took five years. He got a $1 bump. There is now no incentive for anyone to move up, trapping him in middle management instead of training his replacement to gain a salaried promotion. This is happening now, not in five years, now. If they put the arm in and lay him off before the next election, we're toast. With the UBI, what's to prevent companies from stagnating wages like this to other employees that stay in the workforce? Is there anything that would incentivize these large corporations to pay people what they are worth, especially if UBI isn't implemented? Here's my answer. This is a good example of one of the problems with minimum wage hikes. Someone already earning that amount, or earning slightly more, can feel really screwed over by them. Yes, it can make a big difference for those who get the raises, but it can cause other problems. Better instead to just raise the floor so that everyone's before-tax incomes are increased. As for then making sure employees are paid what they're worth, that will always be up to employees. People have to be willing to quit and to work elsewhere. They have to be willing to refuse to work unless their conditions are met. They have to be able to organize with other workers to create collective bargaining power. UBI will help with this by increasing the individual bargaining power of workers, but it's still up to all of us as workers and citizens. Employers have to fear that if they don't do the right thing, their bottom lines will be hurt. They'll lose good employees, or they'll lose revenue through shutdowns or boycotts, or they'll face legal repercussions. UBI isn't going to fix everything, but the one huge difference it makes is that it better empowers people to do everything else that must be done. I also think that a forward-looking UBI looking at automation as a good thing should make it so that the more automation, the better. People like your husband should be actively rewarded for finding ways of increasing productivity, and he should get a bonus, and everyone should get a higher floor as a result. More unions and higher minimum wages aren't going to cut it. The people must demand that the benefits of technology flow unconditionally to everyone through the creation of an income floor that steadily rises. I like Robert Anton Wilson's take on what he called the rich economy. He wrote, Unemployment is not a disease, so it has no cure. Stage one is to recognize that cybernation and massive unemployment are inevitable and to encourage them. This can be done by offering a $100,000 reward to any worker who can design a machine that will replace him or her and all others doing the same work. In other words, instead of being dragged into the cybernetic age kicking and screaming, we should charge ahead bravely regarding the toilet society as the utopian goal humanity has always sought. Stage two is to establish either the negative income tax or the guaranteed annual income so that the massive unemployment caused by stage one will not throw hordes of people into the degradation of the present welfare system. Stage three is to gradually, experimentally, raise the guaranteed annual income to the level of the national dividend suggested by Douglas, Bucky Fuller, and Ezra Pound, which would give every citizen the approximate living standard of the comfortable middle class. The reason for doing this gradually is to pacify those conservative economists who claim that the national dividend is inflationary or would be practically wrecking the banking business by lowering the interest rate to near zero. 
It is our claim that this would not happen as long as the total dividends distributed to the populace equaled the gross national product. But since this is a revolutionary and controversial idea, it would be prudent, we allow, to approach it in slow steps, raising the minimum income perhaps 5% per year for the first 10 years, and after the massive cybernation caused by stage one has produced a glut of consumer goods, experimentally raise it further and faster toward the level of a true national dividend. Stage four is a massive investment in adult education for two reasons. People can spend only so much time fucking, smoking dope, and watching TV. After a while, they get bored. This is the main psychological objection to the workless society. And the answer to it is to educate people for functions more cerebral than fucking, smoking dope, watching TV, or the idiot jobs most are currently toiling at. There are vast challenges and opportunities confronting us in the next three or four decades, of which the most notable are those highlighted in Tim Leary's SMILE slogan, Space Migration, Intelligence Increase, Life Extension. Humanity is about to enter an entirely new evolutionary relationship to space, time, and consciousness. We will no longer be limited to one planet, to a brief, less than a century lifespan, and to the stereotype and robotic mental processes by which most people currently govern their lives. Everybody deserves the chance, if they want it, to participate in the evolutionary leap to what Leary calls more space, more time, and more intelligence to enjoy space and time." End quote. I like how this rewards automation and also makes sure the UBI rises as automation rises. This is how we lean into automation and accelerate it in a way that benefits everyone. The next question was from Spaceman Seeds, who asked, How does Yang intend to pass his UBI proposal through Congress? It may be a great idea, but we all know Congress will never pass anything that helps the American people. Here's my response. I'm not that cynical. If I were, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing. And yet by doing what I've been doing, I know I've made a real difference towards that goal. I know it's possible to move the wheels of government. I've even been, for the first time, stepping behind the curtain and seeing more of the great collective Oz as he does his thing in the background. Yeah, Congress is practically broken, but it's not entirely broken, and really the reasons are greatly on our shoulders. If 90% of the population voted, we wouldn't be where we are, but because so few people vote, what we see happens, and then more people think that what's the point of voting? Yes, gerrymandering greatly rigs the system, but not entirely. Yes, big money has a ton of pool, but not entirely. Yes, states with low populations mean that one person's vote in Wyoming is a heavier weight than one person's vote in California, but that person still counts. I wrote an article before that talked a bit about learned helplessness. I feel the belief there's no point is tied to this, that we've been trained to think we're helpless when we aren't, but because we believe it, that belief holds us back from actually fixing the problem. Yes, there are barriers and obstacles, and yes, we should focus on reforming those barriers as part of our push for UBI. We need stuff like ranked choice voting, multi-member districts, cvervote.org, open primaries, automatic voter registration, the national popular vote state compact, voting at home, and more. We need all kinds of policies to expand our democracy as part of winning UBI, but I don't think UBI is impossible without them, just more difficult. However corrupt they are, politicians want to win elections. If they come to believe they will lose by being against UBI, they will support UBI. I think we can win that fight. It's ultimately up to us, though. The next question is from Canis Familiaris Labus. Hi, Scott. I've been following the basic income movement on off for five years. Your article on self-driving trucks was one of my first introductions. I wanted to thank you for writing about UBI and popularizing it. My question, is basic income reaching a critical mass of support? In the past couple months, we've had Rudger Bregman go viral. His book has months-long wait lists at my local bookstore, library, and Amazon. Andrew Yang going viral on Joe Rogan and the Finland experiment making headlines. From your experience as an advocate, has there been exponential growth and in interest and approval for basic income over the past several years? When do you see the tipping point occurring for mass approval? 
My response was this. Thanks for reading my trucks article. I'd have to look at the stats again, but I think that's my second most read article so far, at least within my ability to see the view counts. There are always peaks. You can see them in the Google Trends, where something causes a bunch of interest, then it fades, then something else hits, then that fades. Each time it continually builds, so the trend line is up, but I don't expect any different right now. For example, the Finland experiment was a huge boost when it was announced and started. The preliminary results were a small boost, surprisingly small actually. I think stuff like Trump is sucking all the oxygen out of the room, where stuff that should be and would be getting discussed more isn't as much as it would be otherwise. The big wild card, though, is Yang. Because he is campaigning on UBI, everything he does and everywhere he goes, he's building an awareness around UBI, and that's potentially a game changer, especially when he arrives on that debate stage and everyone has to debate UBI to a nationwide audience. That's where there's potential to achieve critical mass, is through his debate appearances, and I think there's the potential for an entirely different discussion around UBI on the other side of those debates, and much, much more momentum. The next question is from Brush Mechanic, who says, Hi Scott, thank you for this. Would UBI be taxable income? UBI is not taxed. Only income on top of UBI is taxed. There can be confusion here when thinking about a negative income tax. A NIT and UBI can be designed to have the same net transfer outcome, but a NIT is effectively a tax to UBI. Example, let's say you were earning $1,000 per month. A NIT could say that because you were earning that, you get $500 per month in NIT. A UBI would provide $1,000 per month, and then because you were earning $1,000 per month on top of it, tax you $500 per month, leaving you with a total of $1,500 per month. So both have the same result, but one reduces what's distributed and the other reduces what's earned. What makes the UBI better, in my opinion, is not the amount. People in general focus too much on the amount. The great power of UBI is its lack of conditions. If you know you will start each month with $1,000, that's something you can plan around. There's a great security in that dependability. It's also less admin intensive. You just give everyone the same amount instead of hundreds of millions of people different amounts. Incomes are varying more and more month to month. In that environment, a stable income is far more useful than an income that varies based on your variance. The next question was from Better Call Salsa, who said, What do you think happens in the second phase of a UBI economy? Does the public demand higher UBI payments forever? Here's my response. It's funny, I hear that one a lot, and I don't see it applied to other things. It's been a fear since the founding of our country, actually when the fear of people voting away the wealth of the rich led to two strategies, either a strong middle class that would be happy enough to not vote it away, or by limiting the ability to vote to landowners. As the franchise expanded, and really since the arrival of something more like a democracy only recently with the full enfranchisement of women and African Americans, we've actually been voting for lower and lower taxes, which is a form of more and more money, and yet it's been damaging but it's much different than voting for UBI. Lower and lower taxes starves government of the ability to do what we originally intended it to do, which was secure our liberty. A UBI expands that liberty through more security. I think Alaska provides a potential example. Since 1982, Alaskans could have been figuring out ways of increasing their dividend. Only under Sarah Palin did that happen, with a one-time bonus but it's always been based on 25% of the oil revenue being put into the fund. Why didn't they vote for 30% and then 35%? Why haven't they insisted there's more natural wealth than oil, which there is, so as to add new streams of revenue? I think it's actually really difficult to get people to vote for money because most people tend to assume that it's their money that's going to be the source of the money or they think that they are going to strike a rich any day, and so they don't want high taxes on the rich, because when they win, they want the spoils. We're all a bunch of temporarily embarrassed millionaires, as the saying goes, right? So I personally think our goal should be to create a UBI that is indexed to rise with productivity. I'd like us to see that, say, 25% of GDP, or however we measure the economy, 
should function as a floor, with the other 75% left to be earned on top of it. That itself will be a challenge. I don't think the challenge will be preventing people from making that 30%, then 40%, then 50%. If that were likely, all this UBI advocacy stuff would be far, far easier than it is. The next question was from Zalef34, who asked two questions. Will people have the possibility of being disqualified from UBI, e.g. felons? And is UBI intended to replace existing welfare programs or just be added on top of the programs? The question of UBI in prison is a discussion we're definitely going to need to have. However, the only thing to debate is what happens when people are in prison, not after. Once you've done your time, you've done your time. UBI should at the very least start back up the day someone leaves prison. However, what's up for debate is what happens in prison. Should UBI be used to pay for a prisoner's basic needs like room and board? Should it depend on if they're in a public or a privately funded prison? It could potentially be problematic to allow for-profit prisons to see people with UBI as a source of profit, right? What also about the type of crimes and imprisonment involved? Personally, I like the opportunity UBI presents to enable people to be under house arrest. Without UBI, you can't do that because people need jobs. They have to leave the house to live. With UBI, nonviolent criminals could just have to stay in their homes with GPS anklets and only have to go to prison if they don't follow the rules of house arrest. That could save taxpayers a ton of money on prisons and greatly reduce the for-profit prison industry. I also personally would prefer that even those in prison who are guilty of violent crimes should continue to receive their UBI and not have to pay out of it. I think that we look at imprisonment all wrong, and that if we as a society choose to lock people up, we're the ones that should pay for it. The burden should be on us. I'd much prefer us to look at places like Norway as an example of how to handle criminals. However, I also understand that we are as we are here, and we want our pound of flesh and love to punish people, so if there's no support for the way I would prefer, I understand, and as long as prisoners get their UBI upon leaving prison, that's better than no UBI at all. The next question was from Bellocracy, who asked, Hey Scott, so I'm from rural Iowa, where local stores are closing rapidly, because of multinational corporations like Walmart and Amazon essentially outcompeting them relatively easily, which is inevitably going to cause irrevocable job loss, thus growing the need for a UBI to keep our communities in existence. My question for you is this. How do you think UBI would positively impact rural communities, and how could you get a generally conservative population, rural white voters, to support it? My response was... I've been meaning to write an article for years now, and just haven't gotten around to it yet, that is specifically about just how big of a deal UBI will be for rural areas. UBI will be absolutely transformative in smaller towns and main streets all over the U.S., disproportionately benefiting them more than urban or suburban areas. One of the biggest ways will be through small businesses. Right now, so many people who want to start a business can't either due to lack of capital or fear of risk of failure leading to economic suffering. These people will be able to start businesses, and they will have customers because everyone around them will have UBI. This is my favorite example from the Namibia experiment, actually. A woman used her first UBI payment to go get flour and yeast, and she built a makeshift oven to start baking goods for the village. She was the biggest success and grew an income on top of her UBI, that was much larger than her UBI because everyone loved her stuff and could buy it. Imagine if she'd gotten a standard bank loan. Would she have been successful in a village full of people without money? Not likely. She likely would have failed. What matters so much is the spending power of customers to vote on what they like. Yes, Amazon has a lot of stuff at a lot of great prices. But there will always be the opportunity for local businesses to make money with local consumers who prefer what they are selling because they are local. Because they are local, or unavailable on Amazon. 
Amazon and Walmart have killed so many small businesses, but many of those businesses would never have fallen if all their customers had UBI. Getting rural white conservative voters to support and demand UBI is a bit trickier, but I think it's a matter of perception. People need to see that this money is theirs and that it's being withheld from them. That's why Alaska is so successful with their dividend, because people see it as rightfully theirs. So instead of being some kind of charity case where they feel that the money essentially says they're a failure, they're instead a stockholder who is owed a dividend because they are at least partially responsible for the success. They're winners, not losers. I also think it helps to see UBI as a tax rebate that everyone gets. No matter who you are, you should pay $1,000 per month less in taxes than whatever the tax rate is. That money is yours to decide for yourself how best to use it because government sucks at determining how best to use money. A portion of all tax revenue should therefore go to people with the rest going to government instead of all of it going to government and then some of it going back with conditions attached. People need to see UBI as less government. It's less control. It's less being bossed around. It's more freedom. And really, it's less taxes as far as effective tax rates go. If you're paying $5,000 in taxes right now, and after UBI, you pay $7,000 in taxes, but receive $12,000 in UBI, your taxes may have gone up $2,000, but it paid for a tax rebate that leaves you with $10,000 more in your pocket. Another way of looking at it is that it drops your tax rate to zero and pays you $5,000 instead of taking $5,000 from you. When enough conservatives recognize that, especially rural ones with low incomes, UBI will be a much easier sell. The next question was from Heyo Speaker, who asked, Have you considered a UBI system in which citizens vote on a percentage of everyone's income that simply gets thrown in a pot and split equally? I figured the median vote would be the percentage that would be used. When you deduct the amount paid in, a flat tax, from the amount received back, it works out like a progressive tax rate with an upper limit set by the vote, and anyone making less than the average income gets back more in than they paid in, and it 100% pays for itself. Maybe we could start out this system with a maximum cap on the allowed tax rate, which increases over time as we all gradually learn how the economy and our lives are affected by it. So we actually learn as, as a society how to find the best balance slash best tax rate. Vote too low and obviously you get a smaller UBI paycheck from the system. But if voting too high hurts the economy, you might also get a smaller paycheck to the higher rate because you're receiving a percentage of the overall economy. So even the lowest income earners would have an incentive to find the best balance instead of just voting for the highest possible tax. The tax rate would be an ongoing national debate. Is this a recipe for a transitioning to our automated future? Or do I just not know what I'm talking about? Because I don't. If anyone reading this likes this idea, please tweet it. My response was, I've written about this before as an illustration of a flat tax funded UBI, at least as far as putting a flat percentage of money into a pot to split. Imagine yourself and four friends with the following amounts of money in your wallets. $6, $18, $30, $46, $50. Now imagine you realize the two at the least don't have enough for all of you to go out and enjoy some drinks together. Your friend with $100 could just buy their drinks, but he knows people feel better about themselves buying their own drinks and feels they are starting to resent him for always having so much more than them and always buying their drinks. So he tries something new. Your rich friend suggests that everyone put $40 of their money into a pot, which will then be divided equally amongst all five. The result after doing so is that now the wallets contain $19, $27, $34, $45, and $76. Now your two poorest friends have enough for a few drinks, and you can all go out, but this time everyone feels independent with no one being a charity case. Your richest friend just enabled everyone to go out and have a good time instead of leaving two friends out or straight paying for their drinks for them. The amounts in each wallet reflect the actual income distribution by quintile in the U.S. in 2010. The amounts in each wallet after each throws the same percentage into a pot and splits it 
is the actual distribution after a 40% basic income flat tax. Multiple people have told me this example is one that hits them the hardest as far as understanding UBI and the good sense of it goes. So I do agree that one way we could go about this is to just immediately start with a small flat tax of some kind with that intention. Yang's Freedom Dividend actually does this, by the way, through the 10% value-added tax. It's a negative consumption tax instead of a negative income that functions to redistribute demand instead of earnings. The next question was from MJ Don, who asked, Hey Scott, my boss just wrote an article on how UBI gives a disincentive to work. I pointed to the only example of UBI in the real world I know, Alaska. The labor force participation rate is essentially identical to the continental U.S. Maybe call the plan Alaska Permanent Fund for All. Sort of kidding, but I think comparing it to what is already done in Alaska is a good idea. How do you talk about UBI when asked who is going to work? My response was, your boss doesn't understand the existing disincentive to work created by conditional welfare that UBI eliminates. Here's something to share with him about it. Right now, someone on welfare can receive, say, $10,000 and be offered a $10,000 part-time job. If they take the job, they don't end up with $20,000. They instead end up with $10,000. So the choice is not working or working where the amount of income gained is the same. It's also a 100% marginal tax rate. Isn't it weird how people so often claim that raising taxes to 70% will cause the rich to stop working, but applying a 100% tax rate that results in people on welfare not working is because they're lazy? In that same example, a person with a $10,000 UBI taking a $10,000 job would end up with $20,000 before taxes. All employment leaves someone with UBI better off because the UBI is never reduced. People become rewarded for employment instead of punished for it. Understand that, and it's just silly to think UBI disincentivizes work. It enables and supports all work, both paid and unpaid, and it has particularly strong impacts on part-time employment and self-employment. In Alaska, a study looking at the effects on employment showed a neutral effect on full-time employment. There was a slight reduction through fewer hours, but there was also a bump in employment due to job creation due to increased consumer demand. The big effect was on part-time employment, which has been boosted 17%. I get the feeling your boss never even read that study, so feel free to share it with them. Alaska isn't the only example either. Over and over again, there is just no evidence to support the idea that UBI causes people to work less, especially when we look at what work means. Is the mother of a newborn child working less because she's spending an additional six months with her infant instead of telemarketing while someone else gets paid to watch her kid? Is a student working less because they quit that fast food job to go to college to pursue molecular biology? I don't think so. The next question is from Casey Sucks who asked, Andrew Yang has been giving $1,000 a month to a family in New Hampshire, I believe. Are there any interviews with them to see what a difference it's made in their lives? And two, UBI would stimulate the economy and there would be more money to go around, but I worry about people's rent getting raised. For example, in the US military, they get a set amount of money to do whatever they want with, untaxed, called basic allowance for housing. In Japan, the renters all know exactly how much the military members get and will set their rent prices to that, but only for the military. Rent might be $750 for a Japanese citizen, but $2,500 for a military member. If we all get $1,000 per month, what is to stop renters from raising their prices to squeeze out as much as they can from us? Seems like there'd be nothing we as the little guys could essentially do about it. My response was, it's still very early, but so far it's helping with their daughter's college expenses. And two, if your concern is rising prices, understand that military members have no choice. They can't say no to landlords and live elsewhere. It's basically monopoly pricing in action. UBI, because it is universal and unconditional and a flat amount, opens up the entire country. Does your landlord want to raise the rent? 
Well, right now, you can't really say no. Your job is your job, and you have to stay near it, so your options are limited. With UBI, you can seek out lower costs of living. You aren't tied to your job anymore. You have a cushion under you to help you find a new place to live and a new job. You have more ability to refuse to pay higher rents. You also have more ability to buy your own home. In the 70s experiments, despite being only temporary, with people knowing they were temporary, home ownership rates went up 4-6%. to So we can expect an even higher increase in ownership under a permanent and nationwide UBI. That will reduce rent pressures. There's also the possibility of using land value taxation to effectively redistribute rent increases from landowners to renters and to incentivize increasing the housing supply to reduce rents. One final thing, there's the opportunity for a Henry Ford to enter the picture, where instead of cars, the goal is to make more and more affordable housing. People will want to spend as little of their UBI as they can on housing, and unlike now, where only people with jobs have income security, with the UBI, a new market is created where everyone has some money to spend on housing each and every month. And that means competition for those dollars where right now there just isn't. A smart new startup will look at all these people of the UBI and think, let's figure out a way for these people to spend $400 per person per month on housing. The next question was from John Wood 007, who asked, what's your honest assessment of the 2016 election and the upcoming 2020 election? Do you think UBI will actually happen at some point in the somewhat near future? 10 to 20 years? Do you think the political climate is moving in that direction or towards something else? For example, democratic socialism, rational centrism, etc. My response was, if my honest assessment was not, yes, we can do this in 10 to 20 years, I wouldn't have devoted my life to working to make it happen. Yes, it's possible that UBI in 2020 will be a much larger topic, and it absolutely will be in the 2024 election. Do I think we'll start with a full UBI? No. I think we'll start with a carbon dividend where everyone starts getting a check. It's seen as rightfully theirs, and then they start to look at full UBI differently as a result. The next question was from MGN18, who asked, Good afternoon, Scott. I've been interested in UBI for a while, and the lack of political representation is a frequent cited reason for why it's unrealistic. I think Andrew's campaign has a real chance of changing that, but I'm curious from a psychological standpoint if you think that will change the responsiveness people have to it, or if there are more significant mental barriers still to be overcome for the majority of the population. And my response was, tipping points happen all the time. Like I shared in Yang's AMA in response to someone, people outside of Nixon's circle didn't know Nixon was working on proposing to guarantee income. There was growing economic support for it, but right before he announced it, people in Congress showed little, if any, support for it. They thought it would never make it through the House or Senate, and if it did, it certainly wouldn't be signed by the president. Then in 1969, Nixon proposed it. Those same people went from saying it would never happen to thinking it absolutely could happen, and it even had their support. It went on to pass the House twice. If the Senate would have passed it, Nixon would have signed it, and it would have become law. We would have been the first in the world to implement a negative income tax, and I think the entire course of history would have been changed, with country after country following our lead. So we got very close, and I think automation is something that will only get worse, just like climate change. We can only ignore these issues for so long before the unrealistic becomes the, why in the hell didn't we do this sooner? I'm already seeing a Yang effect happening, and activity is growing. We have Stockton actively distributing a small UBI. We see black mothers in Jackson, Mississippi getting a UBI. We see Chicago looking to start. I also know of more in the background that have yet to be announced. The more people know about it, and the more people talk about it, and the more people demand it and ask their reps about it, the more support there will be. Things also happen faster now. Marijuana will soon be legal nationally. Medicare for all looks increasingly likely to happen. People are tired of politics as usual. UBI represents something different, and Yang is only the first to run hard on it, just like Bernie was the first to run hard on Medicare for all. But now it's pretty much mandatory among the Democratic Party to be for it if you want to be called progressive. 
The next question was from Skywalker1970, who asked, Basic income in other countries has proven a losing proposition. Wouldn't it be better to grow the economy so that we need more employees and then work to ensure that people that are currently without employment are ready for the new jobs that are created? My response was, not sure we are getting that one. Switzerland was the first to vote on it, and they didn't pass it, but that's normal for Switzerland. They didn't extend the franchise to women the first time around either, but 12 years later, they did. Brazil passed you behind a law back in 2004. They just made the mistake of leaving it up to the president to execute the law, which has yet to be done. Italy's recent election was also all about basic income. At least that's what they called it, even though it's conditional. And it proved a winning strategy for the five-star party. That's happening there, and it's happening because the people wanted it. Finland tested it and decided to not expand the experiment without first getting the results of the first two years. We'll see what they do in 2020 once the final results are in. But the people of Finland are certainly not happy with the direction they've been going in the opposite direction towards more conditions. UBI also grows the economy. There's no faster way of growing the economy than putting money into consumer hands in an economy that is 70% consumer-based. The next question was from Past Stage 6, who asked, Hello Scott, my questions relate to implementing the UBI state versus national. Do you believe it would be more effective to first start pushing the idea on the state level to gain steam for a national push? You've written extensively about the Alaska model, and it seems in my view easier to replicate in states like Texas with massive oil reserves like Alaska. Or do you believe a national push is best? Thanks. My response was, yes, I see state UBIs as having huge potential, if not the greatest potential, for nationwide UBI. Thanks to citizen signature initiatives, states like Washington and Colorado, who voted to legalize marijuana, can also vote to create a small UBI. They could even partially fund the UBI with marijuana revenue if they wanted. I actually just provided written testimony to the House of Delegates in Maryland, who are considering being the first state to follow Alaska's lead by creating a statewide wealth fund that pays a dividend. And it's actually even based on marijuana revenue. The more states that do this, the more people start receiving universal cash, and the more people like it and see that it works to make things better. Also, find and read the paper Applying the Alaska Model in a Resource Poor State by Gary Flomanoff. I share that paper a lot. The next question was from Stonelore, who asked, Hi Scott, I'm a longtime user of the UBI sub, and this is a first time AMA question. Do you think Yang's view of using a value-added tax as a revenue source is good only as a first phase towards something like the diverse citizens portfolio Peter Barnes supports, or would the VAT only be sustainable on its own for a long while? My response was, I like the VAT in combo with UBI. I would prefer to see us shift from income taxation to indirect forms of taxation like consumption taxes and transaction taxes. It's effectively a redistribution of buying power, where someone at the top buying something expensive allows everyone else in the economy to have a bit more money to buy something of their own. There are other things I'd prefer, so yes, I see it as a first phase, but that phase could be 50 to 100 years long or more. I want to automate everything we can. That includes taxes. Something like an automated payment transaction is something I find really interesting, where any time money changes hands, some of it just basically disappears, and money is then freshly created universally in everyone's bank accounts, perhaps at the Fed or something similar. This would save a ton of resources by just baking the UBI into the economy, eliminating all taxes as we know it, and changing the way we create money from benefiting banks to benefiting all of us. I find something like that far more interesting, but that may be something that takes the population of people with UBI to demand and make happen. The next question is from Moose Rider 2, who asked, Hi Scott, and thank you. In a practical political landscape where Democrats and Republicans must agree on a compromise, what are the bare minimum requirements to achieve the intended goals of UBI? In particular, what are your thoughts on one amount? Is there a hard line to take at $1,000 a month, or does $100 have similar upsides? Are there diminishing returns? Two, population size. Is the bottom 10% of earners a start, 
three requirements, a dependent requirement or something more extreme like drug tests, acceptable. Thank you for your time. My response was, bare minimum, in my opinion, is full universality. The lack of conditions is what makes UBI so transformative. The amount is not as important as people think it is. So I really don't care about the amount as long as it's something at least equivalent to food stamps and as long as everyone gets it. An exception is a child allowance component. Because I think full universality requires that kids be included, likely with a partial amount, it makes sense to start only with kids, then after that with all adults. Now we could start at the state level, so say Colorado could do it universally, which would be a fraction of the U.S., but it would still be seen as universal because it's universal there, and the amount would likely be lower than a full UBI. Absolute hard no on drug tests. UBI must be free of conditions. No paternalism. This is where I see the greatest importance of those on the right. Conservatives need to fight for small government, which means no tying strings to the cash. Alaska's dividend does not test people for drugs. Welfare does. UBI is not welfare. I think one potential compromise worth consideration is the elimination of or freezing of minimum wages in return for a higher UBI. That could be something both sides could agree to as one example. I also think there needs to be a willingness to consolidate welfare programs and simplify the tax code. A potential compromise here is that the UBI could be counted as income for qualification for existing programs. An example is that let's say there's a welfare program that says only those earning less than $500 per month qualify. Let's say that program costs us $10 billion per year. Instead of fighting over ending the program, we could say let's keep it, but because everyone is now earning over $500 per month, no one qualifies for it. That $10 billion is shifted over to UBI, even though the program still exists. Another area is states versus federal. A national UBI is obviously going to lift a lot off the shoulders of states, and people in expensive states need more income than those in more affordable states. This was part of the discussion under Nixon's Family Assistance Plan, and it needs to be part of the UBI, too. What states need to do to make sure no one is worse off, and that they help pay for the UBI, considering they will be saving so much money with UBI in place. I think there are points of agreement we can reach if all sides care enough about making UBI happen. And that was the last question that I answered. Thanks for the questions, everyone. I hope you found my answers helpful, and thank you for your interest in Andrew Yang and desire to get more involved. We need people being as active as they can, and that could mean as little as making sure to upvote, like, favorite, and share stuff on social media. And as much as starting local groups, writing op-eds, calling representatives, doing phone banks, and going door-to-door. Whatever you can do, please consider doing that. Every bit helps, and don't be afraid to get creative, speak out, and risk negative feedback. There's worse things than being called a communist by a capitalist and a neoliberal by a socialist. Believe me, I get it pretty much every day, and I'm just fine. Also, if you'd like to support my work in addition to Yang's, you can do that via Patreon or Anchor. Cheers, and uh, thanks for listening.